wondered when you said I uh, earned that PhD at Stanford in 94, I, I still really can't show myself around campus in fear they might take it back. Uh, but I did get through that program. So uh, what I wanted to talk to you today is uh, here in myths and realities of uh, campaign finance, and then hopefully at the end, maybe some lessons for reform. And are we okay with uh, hearing back there? Um, we'll have time. We'll have time for Q and A at the end here. But uh, you know, I grew up in Connecticut, but since moving to Missouri, I'm, I'm getting more accustomed to uh, the. Uh, oh, I can't think of the word. Uh, sort of shouting out when the spirit moves you. Uh, uh, so, you know, if you feel so moved, that's fine. I can take questions along the way, but we will have some time uh, as, as we get towards the end. I'd like to start, and I think we have a pretty, uh, pretty selected, uh, selected and well informed crowd here, uh, certainly relative to the general public. So, uh, let me just get a gauge of that by offering you a, uh, a true false quiz. Five questions. Uh, you keep track of how many you get right here. So, uh, true or false? It is uh, illegal for corporations to contribute to federal candidates. Okay, you keep track, and the answer to that is uh, true. It is illegal for corporations to contribute money to federal candidates directly. Uh, is it illegal for unions to contribute? Or, uh, true or false? Sorry. It is illegal for unions to contribute to federal candidates. Think about your answer, and that is also uh, true. True or false, the Democratic Party uh, this election cycle is spending more than the Republican Party in the federal elections. <coughs> and the answer to that is uh, also true. <coughs> true or false, political action committees this cycle are giving more to Democrats in federal races. Think about your answer, the answer to that is also true. And finally, uh, corporate political action committees are giving more to federal candidates than labor political action committees. The answer to that is also true. So uh, we can gauge you against the general public here. How many got three or more correct? Just a quick show of hands. So actually very, uh, very good there. It looks like over 50%. If you ask these kinds of questions to the general public, uh, what you'll find is that about 12% of respondents can get three or more of those correct or uh, questions like that. Now think about that a second. You could have gotten zero right, one right, two right, or three right, four right, five right. Uh, and so you'd expect people to get half of those right. You'd expect 50% of people to get half of those right. And another way to think about it, untrained gerbils pushing levers at random corresponding to true and false. You'd expect them to get three or more. So the general public is not just uninformed in that they only 12% of them can get half of those right. They're actually quite misinformed when it comes to uh, campaign finance issues. And so that's our first uh, uh, point here. The public is not just extremely cynical about the role of money in politics. They're quite ill-informed, and we need to keep that in mind. Uh, but as a consequence of that, reform policies are often shaped by demagoguery taking advantage of this ignorance and misinformation. So we want to be able to guard about that. Uh, but then these populist policies are often checked by the Constitution. And so the Supreme Court gets a bad rap for, uh, for doing that. What I'd like to do, my goal today, it's very lofty, uh, science meets civics. So I'll try to tell you about some studies and facts and also uh, weave in some civics lessons there and, and, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, come away with a better understanding of the role of money in politics. So let's start with conventional wisdom. Anyone who's uh, fairly well informed uh, is probably ill informed about the role of money in politics. Here's the conventional wisdom. Uh, first of all, I think it be summed up, there's too much money in politics. So what do we mean by that? Well, elective offices are for sale to the highest bidder. And campaign contributions are the functional equivalent of bribes. In other words, you've got a market for political favors, trading money for favors. That leads to a flood of special interest money, which distorts public policy, leaves incumbents entrenched. There's almost a vicious cycle here because looking at that, the public gets alienated, 
and tunes out, voter turnout is decreasing, trust in government is decreasing, and it, and it leaves more room for these nefarious things to be going on. And as always, everything in popular culture is a trend that's getting worse. Uh, the situation is deteriorating, and many people would point to the Citizens United case as an example of, uh, of the situation getting worse. And the only conclusion in this conventional wisdom is that we need real reform, uh, and that's critical to the preserving uh, the integrity of democracy. What I want to uh, try to suggest to you is that every element of this argument is either unsubstantiated or, or runs counter to existing social scientific evidence, and I'd like to give you some uh, appreciation of that. So uh, let's start by backing up, and I just want to do a little bit of uh, background on the, on the legal side. When it comes to uh, campaign finance reform, uh, <clears throat> there's uh, an unfortunate trade-off embodied in our Constitution, which is that on the one hand, we have these egalitarian ideals, we should have open and free elections, uh, and also equal protection of the law, so that when policies being bought and sold by wealthy interests and special interests, there isn't equal protection of the law. On the other hand, we have those guarantees of free association, freedom of speech, the right to petition government, so that uh, people should be able to use their time and talents and treasure to get involved in politics. Uh, and so that there's some sort of trade-off between these, these goals embodied in the Constitution. Well, the Supreme Court has to figure out where to draw the line here. And, uh, and so what the court has done is to say that when we read that First Amendment, Congress shall make no law uh, that infringes on, on those freedoms, of uh, speech and association, the right to petition, we should read it as Congress shall make no law except to prevent corruption and the appearance of corruption. Those are the only legitimate policy goals that, that uh, need to be underlying any kinds of regulations that, that restrict uh, political activities. Now, what do we mean by corruption? Well, on this, uh, most Supreme Court justices agree. That's nice when they agree. Uh, corruption is undue influence. The problem is when you ask them, what's on new influence? You don't know. There, I have never seen a definition of due influence. Uh, and in a democracy, there's got to be some influence of policies and politicians. That's what it's all about. And so without a definition of due influence, this idea that corruption is undue influence is, is vacuous. Uh, there are two factions in the court. The one that's the current majority interprets corruption in, in what many people see as a very narrow or cramped way. They, they uh, interpret corruption as meaning quid pro quo corruption, cash on the barrel head exchanges of cash for policy favors. So the stuff of bribery, real bribery and influence kind of While the current minority on the court, which at times has been able to craft the majority, um, has, a, has a more nebulous definition of influence as too much influence. And too much uh, is defined depending upon what kinds of groups we're talking about. So for corporations, a little bit of influence is too, too much influence. Unless they're nonprofit corporations, then they, can, then they can be a little bit more involved. That's Massachusetts Citizens for Life, 1986, which opened up the door to the C4s and C6s that we're now see taking advantage of that, that uh, loophole uh, getting involved with independent expenditures. Uh, so the problem is that you know, we have one side of the car, uh, court defining corruption very narrowly, giving a very clear definition, but it doesn't quite capture, I think, what a lot of people think of as corruption. On the other hand, the other side of the court is giving this more like pornography is, you know, I know it when I see it. Corruption is when I know it when I see it. The problem with that is you have a right to participate in politics or a, a right to associate with other individuals and to try to influence policy. You need to know ahead of time what you can and can't do. You can't, you're not free uh, to engage in politics if you have to hire a consultant a campaign finance lawyer and then maybe talk to federal agencies and wait six months to get some sort of advisory opinion. So we need some clear lines, and that's where the majority of the court has kind of come down on uh, drawing clear, uh, clear lines. But uh, they're out of step, I think quite clearly, with popular uh, opinions about corruption, which I think is better described as uh, sort of a modern miasma theory, that sort of money in general is somehow bad or corrupt, and anything we can do to get money out of politics is desirable. 
Uh, I think that captures a lot of the popular wisdom, but uh, the general public, of course, doesn't have that sworn duty to uphold the Constitution, so they can have that kind of opinion. So the court decisions give us some ground rules for what reforms can or can't look like. And uh, very quickly here, we've mentioned that we want to have this narrow, well-defined area of political activity that's subject to regulation. That's where that uh, definition of express advocacy comes from. So in general, this is um, uh, advocating for or against a candidate, and very explicitly so. Of course, McCain-Feingold expanded the boundaries of what express advocacy means when we're close to an election, so that if you name a candidate for federal office, that will be express advocacy. Uh, as opposed to issue advocacy, everything else about politics that we can talk freely about, and that's unregulated. Uh, but express advocacy uh, can be re regulated. How? The uh, funding for express advocacy, um, the governments may limit the source and size of contributions. So that's why we have you know, contribution limits for candidates, uh, or prohibit coordination uh, in express advocacy. And so that's why we have this category of campaign spending of independent expenditures. And so as long as I want to run advertisements in favor of a candidate for office, as long as I'm doing it independently, I can spend as much of my own money as I want on those independent expenditures. The court has said that that's not corruption because it's not quick, there's no quid pro quo for doing it independently. Now for a while, we had, uh, we had a, a double uh, uh, prohibitions on uh, corporations and unions where they were prohibited from engaging in independent expenditures, even though they were independent. The Citizens United case struck down uh, that provision in the federal law so that now corporations and unions, uh, other kinds of organizations, can engage in independent expenditures. Um, uh, so the idea here is either you have limits for direct contributions or your activities must be independent when it comes to express advocacy. Yeah. Yes. On <clears throat> independent expenditures, can you mention the federal candidate's name even up to the day of the election? This is express advocacy, so yes, you 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 can. Um, and uh, now I'm trying to remember about the uh, the limits under McCain-Feingold, where you have an expansion of express advocacy um, would not uh, under the speech now precedent, which was uh, which is not. Uh, denied cert at the Supreme Court level uh, on, on appeal, uh, but under the uh, speech now precedent, groups can take unlimited expenditures to run, uh, unlimited contributions to run independent expenditure campaigns, even within the, the post elections. That was just today, uh, the court did not cert on, on speech now. Um, Uh, this is why this notion of uh, preventing corruption in particular ways, uh, this is why we see no limits on total spending. Given you're limiting the amount individual contributors can give to candidates, you've taken care of our fears of quid pro quo corruption. Candidates can raise as much money as they want from, from a large number of contributors. No limits on total spending, which is what we saw before Buckley would lay home uh, back before 76. No limits on self-financing of candidate campaigns because a candidate can't corrupt themselves with their own money, so there's no reason to limit that. And no limits on the finance and the ballot measures because uh, campaign advertising and monetary contributions cannot corrupt the text of a ballot measure. And so that's the reason we see those kinds of uh, uh, activities permitted. Public funding is allowed. It can even be conditional on abiding by some spending limits, but it has to be voluntary. You can't force people to accept those limits and take public funding. And uh, disclosure, we can talk about later to keep things moving along here. Okay, so that's just sort of laying our groundwork on why we have the rules we do, why they regulate some things and not others. Let's look at some facts. This is uh, constant real dollars adjusted for inflation, federal <coughs> election spending. 2010 is, uh, is uh, only to date. And so 2010 will probably go up to about closer to four billion. But what you see here is that in real terms, we get this seesaw pattern, presidential election cycle, midterm election cycle. Uh, but that in general, we're, we're getting uh, an increase. It's, uh, you know, I don't know what you think of the scope, whether that's uh, too much money or not, but it is increasing. It's also increasing as a percent of GDP. Uh, so let's say we end up with about $4 billion in total political spending in 2010. 
depending on turnout, that's $40 to $50 per voter, or about 0.025% of GDP. Is, is that enough? <coughs> I don't know. It's less than the charitable giving of Pfizer over that same time period, less than what people spend on potato chips or chewing gum over that same time period. Some very uh, generous back of the envelope calculations on the price of rum. It's uh, George Washington spent more on rum for his voters in 1758. I'm not sure if that really tells us whether this is too much or not. I think more informative is to say what's happening along with this increase in spending. One of the things that we see is that increased spending in federal elections has been coincident with really uh, a, a, a tremendous historical competition for party control of Congress. When it comes to the, the number of times the House and Senate have changed hands this decade, counting tomorrow, uh, that uh, you, we've seen more turnover than we have since the 1890 to 1920 period. And so it, it's really unprecedented. So along with uh, that increased spending is this, is this battle for control of, of Congress. This uh, kind of suggests that as well. And again, I have not made any prediction about exits uh, after tomorrow. So I think uh, once the election returns are in, this is going to look like uh, 2010 is right on that trend line. But this is exits from Congress for all reasons, including resignations and retirements, because when incumbents know ahead of time that uh, it's not going to be a good year, they resign or retire. So if we lump those in with defeats in the primary and the general. What we see is that increase in federal spending is at least coincident with increasing turnover in, in the Congress. Uh, so, you know, too much money? Well, if it's buying us more competition and turnover, maybe, maybe you don't think so. Let's continue down in that list of uh, conventional wisdoms here. Are elections for sale? Uh, to the highest bidder. Well, it is true that incumbents get reelected at a very high rate, especially those that choose to run. Uh, it's a lower rate if we count those that retire because they were going to lose. Uh, average spending in U.S. House races is over a million dollars. Challengers just three hundred thousand. But losing incumbents spend more like two and a half million. Winning challengers more like two million on average. So winning, uh, losing incumbents also outspend their their challengers. There's a lot more spending on those kinds of competitive uh, races. Those descriptive statistics are nice, but they don't tell us about what we'd really like to know. Uh, what's the treatment effect of campaign spending? If you could drop money from heaven onto a candidate, how much better would they do in their re-election race? And uh, this is going to sound very strange, uh, but our best estimates are, at least at the margin, the, uh, the treatment effect of campaign spending is not statistically significant or very close to, to zero. It seems to be very small effects. Now that's different from talking about the inframarginal effects of spending. So for example, if I were running to run for election, I might get 1-2% of the vote just by accident. People might punch that, that line. But if I were to start campaigning and running some advertisements, maybe that goes up to 5%, 10%. If I get a party endorsement, maybe I can get up to 20 or 25%. If I were actually a good candidate, I'd do much better. Though. And that's what's uh, going on here. When we look at incumbents win a lot, and incumbents raise a lot of money, well, it's similar to the reason that uh, men no longer ask Maria Shriver on dates. It's not because Arnold Schwarzenegger has a lot of money. It's because there was already a competition, and he won. So by revealed preference, there's not much point anymore. Uh, similarly, with a lot of candidates. Yes? Did you ask me to try? I have reason after the vote for me. But I lost, I lost, you lost me there. I, do, you, do you mean that the last dollar that I spend is much less effective than the first dollar that I spend? Well, that's, uh, we usually assume that production processes that diminishing marginal right. productivity. What I'm saying is that our estimates are on the marginal effect of campaign spending. So uh, uh, that's what these, these studies are suggesting, is that if there's a, by good candidates, there's enough spending that those mar marginal dollars seem to be driven down pretty close to zero when we do large and statistical studies. Now, how we do this, you know, how, how do you unbundle the fact that candidates that are able to raise and spend a lot of money have attributes that are appealing not just to contributors, but to voters. Right? So that's why we see a high correlation between spending 
and, and successful candidates. The way we try to unbundle that is a variety of different ways. One famous study looked at repeat meetings of candidates. You get the same two candidates going against each other. You observe the changes in spending and the changes in their electoral fortunes. That's one way to try to control for those personal attributes of candidates. Uh, if you do that, you find no statistically significant effects on campaign spending in federal elections. I've done a lot of work looking at shocks to spending, so uh, promotions to committees that are more useful for fundraising or to leadership positions. Um, uh, also looking at war chests of wealthy candidates, do they do better? Uh, and again, the answer seems to be no, no statistically significant effect. Now that doesn't mean we can't think of anecdotes where, where we think money had an effect, but when you look at a lot of data together, we don't really find these strong effects of, of campaign spending at the margin. Similarly with, uh, with ballot measures. So uh, I think the lesson we had is to sort of temper that idea that elections are for sale to the highest bidder. Uh, what about campaign contributions being like bribes? Well, the first problem here is, uh, you know, remember your, your lessons in, uh, in economics. Uh, to have a market, you need to have property rights and contract rights. Well, anarchy is also that true, so it, it helps to have property rights and contract rights. If I want to buy an orange, I need to know who owns the orange. I need to know when I give them money, they're going to give me the orange. Property rights and contract rights facilitate trade. In the political marketplace, you don't have those same property rights and contract rights. Legislative favors are collective actions, and it's not clear who exactly to hold responsible if you don't get uh, what you were promised. And not only that, any promise that is delivered upon might be undone in the next legislative session or even the next day. So you don't have very secure property rights and contract rights. Oh, and it's also illegal to engage in bribery and influence capital. But it also you know, makes it a little harder to engage in these quid pro quo exchanges on top of any campaign contribution and the like. Nevertheless, the pattern of special interest giving is, is quite consistent with the idea that contributions are buying some sort of political favors. When we look at what kinds of groups uh, form political action committees and uh, what kinds of groups give more money, well, it's, it's industries where there's a lot of regulation and federal contracting. Who do they give the money to? They give it to incumbents. They give it not just to incumbents, but incumbents on relevant committees. Not just to incumbents on relevant, com relevant committees, but to incumbents in positions of leadership. And so that's all consistent with the idea that the campaign contributions are buying something. On the other hand, uh, it's also consistent with the idea that you want to um, uh, you know, get your foot in the door to try to talk to people who are important to your industry, that you may want to support uh, individuals that are, have a similar way of looking at the world as you and are in power. Uh, so, you know, what is the treatment effect? Well, if we try to estimate, what's the treatment effect of PAC contributions on roll call votes? Uh, decades of studies looking at this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be the case that, that roll call votes are at all influenced by PAC contributions once you control for party preferences and preferences of constituents. Now, you can say, yeah, but by the time you have a roll call vote on the bill, all the, all the fun stuff's been done. Right? It's all written. And so the, the trades are going on behind the, behind the scenes. And so how can we get at that? Well, one clever way to get at that uh, is to look at event studies of stock market prices. And, uh, uh, and so the idea here is let's take an event like the uh, McCain Finally Day, which, uh, which before it was passed, uh, corporations could give unlimited <coughs> amounts of money to political parties. Now, if you're going to try to buy influence, that's the way to do it. Right? Give a lot of money to the people in charge of the party. Let them use the institution of the party to line up votes and deliver favors to you. Um, so before 2002, corporations can give unlimited amounts to political parties. After 2002, they can't. Not only that, the, uh, you might remember this went to the Supreme Court. It wasn't quite clear how the court was going to decide. So we have the court decision also as another, another event that we can look at before and after. And, uh, and in a study, uh, two MIT uh, researchers studied this, um, looking at do we see changes in firm share prices, those that use a lot of soft money expenditures or contributions <laughs> to parties compared to those who didn't. 
Do we see differences in, in stock market prices before and after these events? The answer is uh, no. Uh, I've done a similar event study looking at the sudden resignation of uh, Livingston. Some of us don't remember uh, Livingston resigning on a Saturday morning when uh, the impeachment vote was kind of a surprise. By Sunday's New York Times, uh, Pastor had already lined up the votes to be the next speaker. Quite a change of political power. And I looked at uh, firms that you might think of as client firms, so headquartered in the res respective states, giving PAC contributions to these gentlemen. And, uh, and what I found was that for firms headquartered in respective states, there was some effect on stock market prices, but in terms of the political activity in these firms, other kinds of uh, uh, PAC contributors, absolutely no effect on share prices. So our contributions like bribes, the stock market at least is saying, no, not so much, okay? Um, let's look at some of the claims that are made out there. Some of you might remember all the fuss over earmarks uh, uh, that, uh, that we heard in the last few years. If we look at individuals who sponsored million dollar or more earmarks, to particular identifiable organizations and corporations, and what kind of cont contributions they got from employees and PACs of that corporation, you can back out an implicit rate of return from those contributions. If you do that, it comes out to be over 1,000%. Uh, and that's actually quite consistent with other studies of this sort. If you look at agricultural contributions and the value of subsidies, you get ridiculously high rates of return. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but you know, I, I'd be willing to empty out my savings account and uh, try to invest in that. I think that the only reason you see that, that ridiculously high rate of return is if it's one, not true, or two, so incredibly risky that it's essentially not true. Uh, and you're really not buying policy figures. Um, another thing to put this all into perspective, if corporations could buy favors with spending, um, let's let's take uh, the outside spending of corporations. So this is on independent expenditures. A very generous estimate for this cycle is about 200 million. If we add in corporate PACs, which of course are not giving corporate money but raising it from individuals, uh, if we add in all the corporate PAC contributions, we're up to about 460 million in political spending by U.S. corporations this cycle compared to corporations spending about six billion on lobbying. So an order of magnitude difference here, which suggests that talking to legislators is somehow more important uh, than giving them money. And then just to put it all in perspective, corporate philanthropy, uh, this cycle, uh, a rough estimate of about 28 billion uh, over the same time period. So if you think of there being a pool of discretionary funding, that corporations can do stuff with to try to get some goodwill either from politicians or the public. They seem to put a lot more stock on uh, trying to generate goodwill with the, with the public and talking to politicians rather than actually contributing money or running advertisements. A couple more facts for you. A uh, big deal has been made of non-candidate spending this election cycle. Uh, what I mean by outside spending here is the sum of independent expenditures, electioneering communication, so that's that. Um, things that mention candidates within 30, 60 days of, uh, of uh, elections, and uh, so-called communication costs. Uh, for instance, if McDonald's sends a letter to its employees saying, please vote for this person, they can do that as long as they're communicating only internally. So the sum of that kind of outside spending, and also plotted here are soft money contributions to the political parties before mccain Feingold. This is all in real terms. So what you can see is when groups could give unlimited amounts of money to political parties, they did, and they didn't rely on these other kinds of vehicles. With the passage of McCain-Feingold, the soft money goes away, and it gets replaced almost completely by, by the outside spending. Uh, and so yes, outside spending has increased, but if you look at you know post-McCain-Feingold, it's not really increasing as a share of total spending. That's relative relatively flat compared to total spending that is increasing. So uh, just some context there for you. So given that, have we seen an opening of the, uh, of the floodgates? Have recent court decisions uh, opened up the floodgates to special interest money? Well, if we look at giving to candidates, uh, PAC contributions are actually falling relative to total contributions, so that special interest money is becoming less important. 
If we look at non-candidate spending, what I just showed you, uh, it's also falling down <coughs> into total political spending. And it's actually uh, true, though, that the party share of that outside money is, is falling. There are more outside uh, groups. Okay, are there distortions of public policy? So really quickly, uh, how, how would we study this? Well, it's, it's not easy, and so we haven't done much of it. Uh, but here's what we try to do. Uh, I've been talking entirely about federal elections, and at the federal level, there's less variation in campaign finance laws. But at the state level, we have a lot of nice variation. We use the states as laboratories. So we have states like Missouri and Utah and Virginia, where anyone can give any amount to candidates, and we have states like Wisconsin and New Jersey, where there are limits, and we have states that have public funding, clean, so-called clean money, public funding, Arizona, Maine, Connecticut now, so we can look across states uh, over time and across states, use that as a policy laboratory to say, as these rules change, do we see changes in things that we care about? One of the things we might care about is uh, distortions in public policy. And uh, one way to look at that is to, is to pick uh, an area where you think special interest contributions might be having a lot of effect. So, uh, alcohol and, and tobacco companies are reputed to be big, bad, moneyed interests. Let's look at excise taxes on their products. Uh, and so this is work that I've done, looking at alcohol taxes and cigarette taxes. How do they correlate with campaign finance reforms? There's actually a, a slight uh, 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 significant effect, about two cents in the beer tax, when you have a more laissez-faire campaign finance regulations. The idea being here being under a regime where, where anyone can contribute any amount who might be more likely to buy a policy, we do see alcohol taxes being a little bit, uh, I think I said, well, higher with more restrictions, alcohol taxes lower with less restrictions. So consistent with the idea that you're buying policy, but nothing that really knocks you over. With cigarette taxes, no significant effect. That's just picking a couple isolated cases. There's other researchers uh, who have tried to do this more broadly and what they do is they say, let me collect a whole bunch of public opinion polls, for instance, on the minimum wage, should it be increased or not, and then compare that with the kinds of policies we see at the state level. Do we see a divergence between public opinion and policies, or do we see convergence? And uh, in general, what you find is that you've got slightly more convergence when you have more laissez-faire regimes. Uh, so, so. Uh, Convergence is lower when you have more restrictions on campaign finance. That would be contrary to the distorted public policy. You also get more convergence in states that have ballot measures. To some people, that's intuitive. Uh, others are surprised because there could be unlimited spending on ballot measures. They think of those things as very distorted. Jeff? Yes. What do you mean by policy coherence? Uh, or this convergence, this coherence between the, the public opinion polls and the kinds of policies oh. that we see. Are they moving together? Um, okay, voter turnout very quickly. Over the same time period where we have increased campaign spending, we have a slight increase in voter turnout. I'm using Larry Sabato's prediction of 40% for 2010. It could be a touch higher, it could be a touch lower, but the idea here is that we're not seeing a decrease in voter turnout over time with increased federal campaign spending. What about if we were to do these kinds of studies more systematically? Um, what's well known, again, in the political science literature is that spending in congressional elections, once you control for other factors, is actually associated with higher voter turnout, more political knowledge, greater trust in government. Uh, what if we do the states as laboratories exercise? This is something I've done, a couple of different studies. What we see is that states with public funding, the same fund on reform, uh, actually have lower turnout, no significant change in incumbent re-election rates. You do get closer races, but it's these publicly funded people who don't really have a chance of winning. So yes, you get closer races, but not, uh, not a change in incumbent re-election rates. And no significant change in trust in government. And this is something that I've got more good progress at. Uh, that's true for um, a broader set of campaign finance regulations, not just public funding. It seems to be pretty unrelated to trust in government. That should make sense. If you think about whether you trust government or not, it's really driven by, is my party in charge? Uh, and not these other kinds of institutional factors. Yes? The uh, trust in government question, it seems like the, uh, what I hear in polling is that the uh, trust is lower than ever right now. Uh, I'm not sure I quite understand your first section up there, that, that some spending is going up and up, and yet trust is going down. 
Good point. Let's see. So at the, at the federal level, trust in government is going down and campaign spending is, uh, is increasing. So at that level, they seem to move together. But, but that's not a great experiment. They're not able to control for other stuff that's going on. I mean, what else have we seen in the last few years? Oh, Congress voting on bills that haven't been written yet. Things like that. So there's other things going on. Uh, so one way to do this is to look at trust in state government and to use that variation in state institutions to say what's the treatment effect of campaign finance reforms at the state level on trust in state government. And so that's where that's coming from. But thank you. That makes it much more clear, right? Uh, okay, to finish up. Let me take a breath. So we've gone through decades of research and at least a full semester course in campaign finance law. So you know, I can imagine I've left some things out that haven't been totally clear. You might have some questions. So. Let me just quick give my, uh, my summary here. Uh, that conventional wisdom on money and politics, it's definitely ill-informed, it's definitely over, overly pessimistic about uh, the corrupting role of, of money in American elections. Um, more challenging to campaign finance reformers is that when we look at reforms that have been enacted at the state level, there's a lot of variation. Uh, and we see states with no contribution limits, we have see states with low contribution limits, we see states with uh, with uh, uh, public funding, we don't really see any changes in the, in the kinds of outcomes that we care about. Uh, incumbent turnover rates, trust in governments, voter turnout, uh, those sorts of things. Notice I haven't mentioned uh, what the effect on corruption is. Uh, and there's a couple of studies that say they're looking at corruption. The results are, not surprisingly, there, there seems to be no effect of campaign finance laws on, on actual uh, measured corruption. The problem with that is if you really did have a corrupt government, you're probably not capturing all of the corruption and measures of like how many people have been sent to jail um, for political corruption. And the other problem from the point of view of a social scientist is that there are so few instances of politicians uh, being convicted uh, for corruption. And so that's a problem from my perspective. There's not enough observation to study that directly. But when we look at these other signposts of corruption, policy distortion, trust in government, we're not seeing much in the way of effects of reform. There can be unintended consequences of reform, something that I have uh, written on for the Institute of Justice, a few different reports here with, with lovely multi, uh, multiple colored covers here, mowing down the grassroots, <laughs> campaign finance, red tape, strangling free speech and political debate and uh, keep out how state campaign finance laws erect barriers to entry for political entrepreneurs. You get the idea here. Now, campaign finance regulations, what's going on over time is, uh, is, is reformist governments are, are playing whack-a-mole with special interest groups. And so they pass some laws and interest groups find another way to try to uh, influence political activity and then we pass another law. And what you get is this agglomeration of a bunch of complex campaign finance laws so that when ordinary citizens try to put the, you know, signs in their yard, get together with a few like-minded people, call themselves a Tea Party, all of a sudden they're violating campaign finance laws and, and getting fined. Uh, and so uh, that's a situation that, that we think uh, can make it difficult for ordinary citizens to participate. So modest proposals, maybe dial back on disclosure and other kinds of regulations for citizen groups, uh, maybe only require disclosure for very large contributions and spending. Another modest proposal, instead of demonizing campaign spending, to take advantage of the fact that only about 0.5% of the voting age population contributes to federal candidates. Uh, if you were to have a, a, a mild tax incentive for contributions, you could, you could flood politics with uninterested money and take advantage of the diminishing marginal productivity of campaign spending and speech if you're worried about the influence of, of special interest groups. The more ordinary citizens give to politicians, the, the less effective is going to be an outside spending or any kind of special interest in influence. And so, you know, if we have about 100 million people voting, that's very optimistic, 100 million people voting in the midterm, if they gave $100 each, that would be $10 million. That totally swamps all political spending. And if they give $10 each, a million dollars. So it would really drive down the effectiveness of special interest contributions. That's a very different approach to campaign finance reform, which is usually just the opposite. And I think it's governed by that sort of miasma notion of money and politics. It's all bad, anything we can do to prevent it. 
And to the extent you're preventing ordinary folks from contributing to politicians, you're making the marginal effect of a special interest contribution, special interest spending, that much more important. And, and so it can be counterproductive. OK, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to take questions um, you know, or criticism, whatever you have. For the price of a lunch, you got a pretty good semester's worth of uh, <laughs> Then has to post it on the internet within a few days and make regular reports. 
you tell me what would be wrong with a law like that? Well, I mean, right and wrong, those are normative things. Okay. So, so I can I can say, you know, obviously a lot of the public would be very uncomfortable with that because their notion of what corruption is is not this legalistic notion. It, it's it's uh, you know uh, this idea that that money is perverting democratic outcomes. And and I you know before uh, really getting excited about a proposal like that, I'd actually like to see a lot more research of the kind that I talked about that trying to look at. Systematically, uh, do we see policy differences uh, across states that have more unregulated regimes? Because you are talking about a pretty dramatic change in the way it can be. Yeah, but you're also talking that it's so hard to follow the money anymore. Uh, well, it, it can be, and that's and so this is you know uh, this is the is the problem is that campaign reformers would characterize the activities of special interest groups to seek out loopholes to get around well-meaning laws. As, as you know, uh, as a problem, and that these activities, like increasing independent expenditures now by by uh, non, non for profits, as uh, as a sort of nefarious activity that is counter to the, the spirit of the McCain Feingold law. Well, that's true. The problem, I guess, is that the McCain Feingold law, you could argue, is counter to the spirit, maybe to the letter of the Constitution. So, you know, as long as you have those freedoms, you're always going to have some sort of loopholes for people to come right wherever you draw the line, what can be regulated or not. Interested money is going to come right up to that line. Um, you know, but independent expenditures, at least from revealed preference, what we're seeing, don't seem to be a perfect substitute for unlimited contributions to parties. Right? We didn't continue on an uptrend. But, you know, there was a lot of substitution, but not, not one for one. Is there a model of state in your view? Again, a normative question, but uh, you know, you tell me what goals, and then then I can tell you more. But I think what we've learned is that what's that? It prevents corruption. Prevents corruption, so that we don't have good evidence on. That's like you know, you can only do studies on what you have observations and evidence on, and so so uh, we don't. The next best thing would be to look at you know public opinion about. It. And things that we think come along with corruption, like policy distortion, uh, entrenched incumbents, uh, reduction in order. I'm going to take the opportunity to, to exercise uh, the moderator's role. So, what about things like state GDP growth? Sort of, uh, uh, again, I would, sort of difficult to measure. I, I would say no <laughs> really studies of that. Chris, any question? Corruption is stuff the other part does. And that's the problem. Corruption is as hard to define as is special interest. I was when you asked the special interest question, I thought about the people from the Girl Scouts who came in to lobby me about X. Clearly, the Girl Scouts are a special interest. Isn't the answer to Bob's question that Missouri has effectively the law that he just suggested? I have to disclose every contribution that everybody makes of any size. And near the end, I have to disclose virtually immediately any contribution over $250. The only difference would be you could make those disclosures happen a little bit quicker. But you're very much, except for the marginal, you're very much exactly what Bob is. No, that's right. Every state has, has uh, disclosure laws, and, and as you said, different uh, time requirements for time we disclose. So any of the states that do not have contribution limits, uh, so Missouri, Virginia, um, Illinois, Utah, are, are going to be that kind of regime. And when we look across states, you know, do we see dramatic differences in things that we think are signposts of corruption or good government? Not really. Let's take one more. Has there been a study of politicians who uh, increased their net worth enormously while they were in office? Uh, you know, there's a couple of really interesting <laughs> finance studies along these, along these lines. And uh, one, uh, one drawback is the financial disclosure reports, you get, uh, you get the asset value in a range. And so an asset could pop up to the next range, and that might mean a big increase in wealth or a small increase in wealth. So, so there are some uh, difficulties in this, but there's a couple of interesting studies that suggest that uh, being powerful is consistent with being really good at picking stocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's thank Jim.